The title of our sermon this morning is Distinguishing Marks of a True Disciple. Distinguishing Marks of a True Disciple. And we're in John chapter 17. And this paragraph that begins at verse 6 runs from verse 6 to verse 10. As we've come to John chapter 17 now, all of the eternal and saving, redemptive purposes of God in Christ are coming to fulfillment. We're at that time in history. The hour has come, as the Lord says, and the Lord and his disciples now are walking toward the Garden of Conflict, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he will soon pray in agony in the Garden, and the Lord Jesus Christ will soon be arrested, tried, and crucified. Now, his words and final concerns as he walks with his disciples are recorded in Scripture. He is preparing to leave this earth. He's going to depart from them to the Father by means of his cross. He's about to leave his disciples. He's going to leave these men. And they're going to be challenged. They're going to be shaken by the events that are coming upon them. Now, he gives them parting instruction, parting words in the upper room as they eat their last meal together in John chapter 13, John chapter 14. And Judas exits that night into the night as the betrayer, the son of perdition on his his evil errand. And in John chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus and his disciples arise and depart now from the upper room. They're making their way now through the city of Jerusalem, along the Temple Mount, toward an eastern city gate and the Kidron Valley that separates Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. His concern, the Lord's concern to this point, has been to warn his disciples, warn them of the hostility, the hatred that they're going to face from this world, the tribulation that they're going to face as they carry on their ministry without him physically there with them. And he knows in this circumstance, having told them that he's going to depart from them, the Lord knows that their hearts are deeply troubled, deeply troubled. And so with these words, his upper room discourse, now his farewell discourse, and now into his prayer in John chapter 17, he intends to encourage them. He wants to warn them, he wants to encourage them, and he encourages them with glorious promises, promises that would comfort them as genuine believers, genuine followers of Christ. He wants them to experience his peace, to give them joy, uh, to assure them that God is faithful to his promises, assure them of the victory of their mission. And some of the greatest texts that we have in our Bibles come from these chapters. John chapter 14, John chapter 15, John chapter 16, and now this prayer in John chapter 17. Upon finishing those words in the farewell discourse, we come to John chapter 17, where in verse 1, the Lord lifted up his eyes to heaven and he prays. He prays. Now this prayer in John 17 absolutely loaded with great theology, great doctrine. And we would expect nothing less of the Lord's Prayer. He prays regarding the the redemptive plans and purposes of God. All of those established in God's immutable and unchangeable and eternal decrees that were made before time began. Now he prays for the glory that is due his name and the glory due the Father through him, beginning in John chapter 17, verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. As we, as we listen to the words of the prayer, right, as we work through the text, we're reminded that he stops and prays this prayer to the Father in their hearing. Often the Lord Jesus Christ went off alone to pray. He stops and he prays this prayer in their hearing. He prays this prayer in our hearing, so to speak, right? As we read the content of this in John chapter 17. In other words, we're meant to hear it. We're meant to listen in now as the Lord prays for his people, those that the Father has given him. We're meant to hear and to meditate on and to contemplate and to be encouraged by the petitions that he makes to God the Father 
as he prays for his disciples here in verses 6 through 19, and then as he prays for all those that would believe through their word in verses 20 through 26. We're meant then, right? We're meant to be encouraged. We're meant to be comforted. Uh, We're meant to be enraptured by the Lord's words here as he prays to his father and here commends us into the hands of God, so to speak. Now, as he, as he intercedes on our behalf with the Father, he's going to make four basic petitions. Look at verse 11. He's going to make four basic petitions on our behalf. In verse 11, he says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, that's awesome, and we're going to get to that verse Probably several weeks. We're going to get to that verse. Verse 17 is another petition. He prays for them in verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Right? A third petition. Drop down to verse 21. A third petition for them. Verse 21, I pray, the Lord says, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. And then his fourth petition, drop down to verse 24. A fourth petition for his people. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may be whole. I can't help but get struck by that, right? I desire that they also whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. It's encouraging, right? It's encouraging. It would have been absolutely thrilling for his disciples, right, those men, to stand by and listen to the Lord pray this for them. It's thrilling for me. It's thrilling for us, amen, to hear it. This is God's word to us. This is the Lord's prayer for you and I. Brother, sister, listen. You can trust, you can trust that these prayers for you, for me, will be answered. These will be done for you if you're in Christ. You will be kept You will be sanctified. You will be one with him in eternity. You'll be with him where he is. Those are glorious promises. You hear in this then, don't you, right? The love of God. The love of God, the love of Christ toward his people. You hear the love that God the Father expresses to God the Son in his eternal gift of a people for his glory. You'll see the the love of God the Son for God the Father in seeking God the Father's ultimate glory. And we'll see further as we go through our text today, the great love that God the Father and God the Son have bestowed on his own, his prized possession, his people. That we should be called into unity with him, that we should be called to dwell with him forever and eternity, that he will be our God and we shall be his people. I am his and he is mine. Amen. Now this love is a, a particular love. It's a distinguishing love. We, it's one of the things that makes it so precious, right? It's not a nebulous, indefinable um, love that is made available No, he loved you if you're in Christ from before the foundation of the world. He wrote your name down in the book of life. You were engraven on his hand, right? He loves you. He loves me. This is a love for a particular person, a particular people. This is a distinguishing love that the Father and the Son have for these specific people. These people of God are a precious possession, And God the Son here now prays for his own. He prays for those people, do you see? Now before the Lord Jesus Christ begins to make these requests for his people made known to his Father, he lays the foundation, he sets the table, so to speak, before making these petitions for them. 
And he does that in our text this morning. John chapter 17, verses 6 through 10. Look at verse 6. As a foundation for, as a basis on which he makes his petitions, the Lord lays a foundation with God the Father in the hearing of his disciples. Verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours And all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Now, if you'll notice, as he begins to pray for his disciples, he grounds his position, he grounds his petitions on who they are in Christ, their identity in Christ, right? He explains why in verses six through 10, why he's praying for these and not for the rest of the world. He makes a case for why the Father should answer his prayers for them. Essentially, he says this, listen, this is who they are. This is who they are. This is what I have done for them. They belong to us. They've been bought with a price, and I am glorified in them. Matthew Henry calls them highly esteemed jewels in the hand of the Father, right? A royal diadem in the hand of the Father, I'm not praying for the world, the Lord Jesus Christ says. I'm praying for these that are truly my disciples. So what follows then in verses 6 through 10 are distinguishing marks of these disciples. In other words, distinguishing marks of a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for these people, those who are truly My disciples, these are distinguishing marks of the people of God. Those who have been given to the Son by the Father. Those for whom Christ died. And now, in John chapter 17, verses 6 through 10, these are those for whom Christ prays. Those for whom Christ intercedes. Now, from our text, verses 6 through 10, we're going to look at four distinguishing marks of a true disciple of Christ a genuine Christian, one who is truly turned from their sin and have entrusted themselves to Christ. That is marked in this text. Those disciples, those Christians are marked in this text by four distinguishing characteristics. If you're a genuine Christian, a true disciple, then you have these four distinguishing marks. You have these if you're a genuine Christian. One, you are distinguished from the world. Two, you are distinguished by special revelation. Third on your notes, you are distinguished by a fruitful faith. And fourth, you are distinguished by preserving grace. Now, if you're a genuine Christian, think with me about these things as we work through the text. If you're a genuine Christian, then one, you're not of this world. You are distinguished from this world. You may be in this world, but you are not of the world, right? Two, you're distinguished by special revelation. The Lord has brought you, by his grace, has brought you from death to life, given you eyes to see and ears to hear, right? And he has saved you by virtue of his grace, by his spirit, through his word. Thirdly, now, by virtue of his grace, you bear fruits of faith in accord with his word. And by his spirit, you are distinguished by a fruitful faith. And fourth, it's the Lord now who keeps you and preserves you by his power. He is the one who will raise you up in the last day. So think about this in the shoes of the disciples, so to speak, right? Can you imagine listening to this as the Lord prays? They would have been very, very encouraged by his prayer. These marks, these distinguishing marks, the disciples are standing there listening to the Lord pray, and the Lord is praying to God the Father about his disciples and ascribing these marks to them. How encouraging, right, to hear the Lord Jesus Christ pray for you in that way. If you've turned from your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ, he prays for you in that way. He prays for you in that way. And I... 
I don't know about you, I love to be prayed for. (laughs) I think Christians do, to know that someone's praying for me. I love to hear someone pray for me. It's just, thank you, Jesus, that someone would think of me to pray for me. Um, Here, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for them, and the Lord Jesus Christ prays for us. They could say of Christ that I am his and he is mine. Now consider if these marks this morning, as we work through the text, consider if these marks describe you. Are you a Christmas tree or a fruit tree? Can you think of the difference? (laughs) Are you merely decorated on the outside or are you bearing fruits of saving faith, bearing fruits of the spirit? Are you a Christmas tree or a fruit tree? If these marks describe you, then rejoice, rejoice, be encouraged, right? Face the ministry that the Lord has given you despite the tribulation, despite the persecution, despite the difficulty. Face it with a bold faith. Live for him. Walk worthy of your high calling, right? Don't let your heart be troubled. These are the intended goals or aims of the Lord's prayer His His discussion with his disciples as they walk toward the garden. Don't let your heart be troubled. Rejoice always and everything give thanks. Praise the Lord. Pursue these marks. Abound in these graces more and more by faith. If these marks do not in any way describe you, then you are still a part of this world. Not just in the world, you are of the world. If you are in this world and of this world, and you are outside the the distinguishing love of Christ for his own, and you will perish unless you come to him. You'll perish unless you come to him. If these marks don't describe you, it should break your heart. It breaks my heart for you. Acknowledge your sin before God. Turn to Christ this morning and be saved. Ask God to do a work of grace in your heart. Start following him today in repentant faith. First, on your notes, true true disciples of Christ are distinguished from the world. True disciples of Christ are distinguished from the world. Look at verse six with me. The Lord prays. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. We've already established in this text how important this is in verses one through five. The Lord comes back to this idea of a distinguishing people, a distinguished people. He comes back to this again and again. He says in verse nine, look at verse nine with me. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. This is a distinguishment. This is a a particular people that are distinguished from the world. The word men, if you look at verse six, the word men there translates the Greek word anthropois. Anthropois, it's plural. And the immediate reference here is to the disciples. If you think about that word men, the immediate reference is to the disciples, those 11 men that are now walking with the Lord. However, that word, anthropos, is often used to translate or is often translated as humanity or people. If you have an ESV, your ESV translation says people, okay? Certainly we would say that what's described here wasn't only and specifically only for those 11 men. You would say also, wouldn't you, that Mary and Martha were given to the Lord Jesus Christ out of the world. We could say that that's true of every true disciple. Those true disciples given to the Lord Jesus Christ by God the Father out of the world, all right? And in verse 20, he prays for all believers who have been given to him out of the world by God the Father. So although the nearest reference is these 11 or these 11 men, the disciples, What Jesus is teaching here is applicable to all believers. Now, what this points to first in verse six is particularity, is particularity. This is a specific group of people, a predetermined group of people. This is not a nebulous, unnamed, impersonal, 
as of yet to be determined group. It's not left up for you to decide whether or not you want to be in that group. It's already been determined, right? This is a particular, a definite group. It's not a a nebulous thing that is just made available to people. This is a particular people, a particular group. He here, he knows their name, right? He's written those names down from before the foundation of the world. He has engraven them on his hand and he's given them to the son in eternity past as a love gift from God the Father to God the Son. The world has not been given. Do you see that in verse six again? The world has not been given to the Son for salvation, only these. And these have been given to him out of the world. They were a part of the world, weren't they? They were a part of the world, but they've been chosen or given out of this wicked world and given to the Son. That describes all disciples of Christ. Now the next phrase in verse six, if you look in verse six, the next phrase could literally be translated, yours they were, and to me, you gave them. Yours they were, and to me, you gave them. That, even the, the, the word order there, right, emphasizes the fact that even before salvation, before their conversion, they belonged to God. Yours they were, and to me, you gave them. Not that he foresees their faith, do you see? Not that he foresees their faith. He owns them. They are his. They were yours. Yours they were, and to me you gave them. The purpose of this, and this is why it's so important to understand these things, right? The purpose of this is not to glorify God's foresight. It's not to glorify his knowledge of the future. It's to glorify his electing purpose, his decree, and his grace in that. Romans chapter 9, verse 10, listen. When Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, and that's important, so that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now let that sink in for a moment. Talking about Rebekah and her two children, the twins, Jacob and Esau, right? Before they were born, before they could do anything good or evil. Why? Why? So that God's glory in his eternal purposes in Christ, according to election, might stand. We're not here to glorify his, is his foresight, his foreknowledge, his knowledge of the future worthy to be glorified? Yes, God knows the future. But it's not his foresight only his knowledge of the future here that's being glorified. It's his sovereign control over all things whatsoever that come to pass. It's that that's being glorified. God's power, the purpose of God according to election. And goes on to say now, it was said to Rebekah, the older, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, it was said to Rebekah, the older is going to serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated before they were born, before they have done anything good or evil, so that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. In other words, not because of anything intrinsically valuable in them. It's not anything lovable in you. It's not anything intrinsically valuable or intrinsically worthy in you. It is all entirely of God's grace And in that, God gets every bit of the glory. John 6, 37. Flip back just a couple of pages and look at that with me. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And look at verse 37. John chapter 6, 37 does not say, does not say, All those that come to me, the Father will give. Does not say that, right? John 6, 37 says, all that the Father gives to me will come. Do you see? This is not foresight in that sense, just simply a knowledge of the future whereby God then reacts to that future No, this is God predetermining 
all things whatsoever that come to pass. It does not say all those that come to me the Father will give. It says all the Father gives to me will come to me. The giving of the Father enables the coming of the people. Do you see? That's taught here in John chapter 6. It's taught in John chapter 10. It's taught, taught in John chapter 17. It's taught all over the Bible. All of this is the gracious foreordaining, electing grace of God toward a people that he has chosen for the Son. John chapter 15, verse 16, right? He says to the disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. I am so grateful for this truth in the Bible, right? If, if God had not chosen me first, I am convinced that I would have never chosen him. If God had not done this work, we would have perished dead in our trespasses and sins. I'm grateful this choice is not based on my worth. Anything intrinsically worthy in me because there is nothing intrinsically worthy in me and I would have gone to hell. I'm so grateful to God that he did this electing work. All praise to his grace, to the praise of the glory of his grace. All the glory goes to God. None of it goes to my works. None of it goes to my decision. I have nothing about which I can boast. All glory goes to God. John chapter 17, verse 6 is expressing sovereign ownership of a people that God has chosen, redeemed for his own glory. Yours they were, and to me you gave them. There is a particularity being expressed here. And although, if you think about it, right, although the Father gives this particular group of people to the Son as a gift, that giving... That granting does not negate the responsibility of the person to hear and to respond to the gospel, right? We are responsible for our sin. It's one of the great mysteries in the Bible, right? How these things harmonize beautifully together. And we believe them because the scripture clearly teaches them and we put them together. They're not, we're not putting together two things that are unrelated. These things are married in eternity past. Um, the Lord rejoices to put these things together even when our finite minds can't fully understand them. It doesn't negate the responsibility to hear and to respond to the gospel. On the side of God's sovereignty, God's people are given by God the Father to God the Son. On the side of man's responsibility, we hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and we must repent and believe. We must repent and believe. Trust Christ Turn from your sin. Think about the graciousness of God to you this morning, that you could come to a worship service like this, hear the word of God preached, be led to repentance, called to worship. But secondly, first, there is a particularity being expressed here. Secondly, there's a distinction being expressed here. There's a distinction. There is a distinction here between this group and the world. Specifically, in light of that distinction, we would have to say that this is a distinguishing love. A distinguishing love. This is a love that God shows toward these people, this group, that he does not show toward everyone else. This is a special love for his elect, right? We've used that analogy before. I could say that I love my wife. I love my wife. But you wouldn't fault me one bit to say that I love my wife and you differently. <laughs> I don't love you the same way that I love my wife, right? God here shows a distinguishing love toward this group of people. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, this distinguishing love, in this distinguishing love, God delivers us from the power or the domain of darkness and conveys us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29, those whom God foreknew. And if you think about that word know, Old Testament into the New Testament, that word know is an intimate word. It means intimate relationship. It's not just a, a, an intellectual knowledge of or a mental assent of. I know that Chase exists. 
No, I know Chase, right? Chase is my brother. It's, it's a distinguishing love. It's a, it's a relational, a personal, an intimate love. And Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 29 says, whom God foreloved, right? He also predestined those to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, having been loved in this saving way by God, we are to live as distinguishable from the world. We're no longer of the world. We're no longer of the world. First John chapter two, verse 15. John says this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves this world, the love of the father is not in him. Someone once asked the question, someone asked the question, if someone took you to court and tried you for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> right? Heard that question before? Think about it. Are you, are you entangled and ensnared in the entertainments and the pleasures of this wicked world? Are you entangled in them? Are you constantly worldly in your conversation? When you get together and you're having so-called, quote-unquote, fellowship at your place, do you talk about the Bible? Is the Lord on your lips? Is the Lord on your conversation? Is he on your mind? Or do you pretty much go Sunday to Sunday without thinking much of him? Do worldly preferences consistently take priority over spiritual matters? Are you consistently or persistently prioritizing the things of this world and not prioritizing the things of God. Day by day, moment by moment, are you retaining God in your knowledge? Who are you living for, right? Titus chapter two, Paul says, verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation is the same grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. That grace of God, given to us by God, whereby we say we're saved if you're professing Christ, that same grace inextricably, inevitably leads to the Christian, the disciple, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Why? Because it's given. It was purchased by Christ on the cross. That grace will result in that fruit. For the purpose that, Paul says there, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Can we do that in our own strength? No, God grants it to us. It's a grace of God. If you've been saved, it's a grace of God that you should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. If you're not, that grace of God has not been given to you. And you are not a people out of this world. You're a person in the world. Does that make sense? that we should look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us for the purpose that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Do you think that Christ gets what he came to do? Do you think he gets what he prays for? Yes. He gave himself for us. If you're in Christ, he gave himself for you that he might redeem you from every, every lawless deed and purify you for himself. If you are being sanctified, if you are being purified, it's a good evidence, good indication that you're in Christ. He wants his own special people zealous for good works. God's people are distinguished from the world. Secondly, on your notes, true disciples of Christ are distinguished by special revelation. They're distinguished by special revelation. Those, to those whom you have given me out of the world, Christ says, verse six, I have manifested your name. I have manifested your name. Look at verse eight. He says, for I have given to them the words which you have given me. Now, what did the Lord do for these disciples? And by implication, what does the Lord do for all true disciples of Christ? What does he do for those who have been given to him by the Father? He manifests, he reveals, or he makes clear the name of the Father to them. Now, this is similar to verse 2. If you look at verse 2, 
when the Lord says he gives eternal life to as many as the Father gives him. This is referring to a salvific special revelation, not just saying God's name. I told you God's name. That's not what it's talking about here. I want you to understand, go a little deeper than that, right? Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, the Lord says this. He says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. The Son wills to reveal. To the world? No, to this group out of the world. He takes this group out of the world, this group that God the Father has given to God the Son, and he manifests to them the name of God. John chapter 1, verse 18. John says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared. The word there mean, means exegetes. He has exegeted him. He has explained him. He's dug out of that, the truth of who God is, and he reveals that to God's people. Now, what does all this mean, right? I have manifested your name. I've given to them, to them, verse eight, the words which you have given me. What does this mean? One, it doesn't mean that Jesus taught the disciples the various names of God. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that he told them the divine name. Certainly, the disciples knew the divine name and knew the names of God from the Old Testament. They knew their Old Testaments, right? God's name here, I've manifested your name. God's name here encompasses all that God is and all that God does. It encompasses his, his character, his nature, his attributes. And the supreme revelation of all of that, think about it, the supreme revelation of who God is and what God has done, all of God's nature, characteristics, and attributes, the supreme revelation of that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the supreme revelation such that the Lord Jesus Christ could say, right? He who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Colossians chapter one. He is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews chapter one. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. In other words, he has manifested your name to those whom you have given me out of the world, right? So now flowing out of God's purpose as it was decreed in election, Jesus Christ then savingly reveals the Father to those whom the Father has given him out of the world, right? Christ is the only one who can do this. Christ is the only one who can reveal the Father in this way, and Christ is the perfect revelation of the Father in this way. Christ reveals him or manifests his name to them, and he does this personally, right? Right? To those men, those 11 disciples, he's done that personally. But to every disciple of Christ, he does that personally. Listen, if you're in Christ, right? If there was a point in time when you turned from your sin and put your faith and trust in Christ, you became broken over your sin. You acknowledged that you were bankrupt before God. You were given a revelation of who God is. And that was done by the work of Christ through his spirit in you revealing or manifesting the name of God to you. God is holy and I am not, right? God is gracious and merciful and I can come to him and cry out to him to be saved, to be forgiven of my sin. He is abounding in grace, abounding in mercy, but God is also abounding in justice. And if I don't turn, I will perish, right? Right? Jesus Christ reveals or manifests the name of the Father, doesn't he, in all the conflicts that he had with the Pharisees. And you think about those conflicts that we've looked at in the Gospel of John, one after the other, manifesting God's great patience, right? His long suffering with vessels prepared beforehand for destruction, manifesting God's grace and his mercy, manifesting his justice, his wrath, his judgment, his righteousness, he reveals the, the holiness and zeal of God as he takes a whip of cord in, cords in his hand, right? He manifests the compassion of God towards sinners when he witnesses that woman at the well, right? When he, 
when they all go to the tomb of Lazarus and you see Jesus Christ there grieved for one whom he loved. He certainly, he most clearly manifests the name of God, his holiness, his justice, his mercy, his grace at the cross, right? Preeminently, ultimately at the cross. This is not merely an intellectual understanding of these things, right? You have two different people, both reading the Bible. One, a genuinely saved, blood-bought, spirit-indwelt believer and some philosophy, psychology, academic. (laughs) And they both read the Bible. They both may come to an understanding of what's being taught in the passage and both have two completely different, diametrically opposed responses to it, right? One empowered and fueled and motivated and illumined and enlightened by the spirit of God and one not so much. <laughs> Just, and that's, that's, that, is, that is the special revelation, a supernatural revelation that takes place in the life of a believer and is done by God. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, right? He cannot. They are foolishness to him can't know them because they are spiritually discerned. So when the natural man, right, the hard-hearted, wicked son of disobedience comes into contact with the holiness of God, apart from a supernatural revelation of God in Christ, he's not going to weep and mourn over his sin, but the true disciple will. The true disciple is going to mourn over their sin. He won't turn that natural man apart from a supernatural revelation of God in Christ won't turn from living life for himself. He'll regard all of that as foolishness. But that one whom God has given Christ out of the world, that one will, that one will. He'll turn from living life for himself and heart, soul, mind, and strength he'll live for Christ. That revelation, that I have manifested your name, right? That revelation is a supernatural work of God, of God in the heart of man. It's a supernatural work. Now, he, he further reinforces that in verse eight. He says in verse eight, for I have given to them the words which you have given me. This is the truth of God. He's referring to, to sound doctrine here, good theology, revealed by the Son of God through the Spirit of God and this supernatural revelation. It all causes the genuine disciple, the true disciple, to proclaim with the psalmist, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. You understand, right? That's, that's not a, the natural response of a natural man. That's the response of someone who loves God's word who delights in his law, who meditates in it day and night. And the reason for that is a revelation of God in Jesus Christ. These are life-giving words in verse eight, right? Life-giving words. Again, and we're stating an obvious point here, a repetitive point, it comes back to this. He doesn't do this for the world. He doesn't do this for the world. Now that cuts across the grain of most of evangelical thought today, but that's what the Bible teaches, right? And it renders foolish so much of what passes for evangelism today, what so much passes for preaching. It renders it foolish. One uh, commentator I heard uh, commented um, how foolish it would be to put a bumper sticker on the back of the ark that reads, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> right? You know how absurd. But that's exactly what goes on today, right? There are bumper stickers on the back of this ark. Those bumper stickers are saying, many of them, God loves you, have a wonderful plan for your life. No, no, no. If you put all those bumper stickers on the inside of the ark, that would be, that'd be right. But not on the outside of the ark. The gospel call goes out to all men indiscriminately. The gospel co- call goes out to all but only some are enlightened. Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen, few are chosen. Although, John chapter one, 
He was in the world. The world did not know him. Although he came to his own, his own did not receive him. It's only for those given to the Son by the Father. The promises of God, the blessings of God, all of these comforts and encouragements of God all flow out from his divine and gracious election. Acts chapter 13, verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Let's look at this in context quickly. You're gonna have to listen faster. Go to John chapter two. John chapter, somebody needs to pull the batteries out of that clock back there for me. If you don't. John chapter two. And let's just take a look in John at this. John chapter two, where this is the case, all right? And again, if it weren't in the Bible, people wouldn't believe it, right? But because we have the clear word of God teaching us these things, we can believe by his spirit, we can understand and we can rejoice. John chapter two, look at verse 23. Just one example. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. Initially, that sounds pretty encouraging, doesn't it? That many believed. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And we worked through that text as we're preaching through the Gospel of John. We came to understand that God, that Jesus Christ did not manifest God to them in the way that we're talking about in John chapter 17 because they were not of his sheep. They're not of his people. They were of the world. And although they expressed some kind of superficial belief in the Lord because of his miracles, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't commit himself to them. They weren't saving, saved believers. Look at John chapter six, just a couple of pages to the right. John chapter six. And look at verse... John chapter 6 at verse 41. 41. Here the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among your, amongst yourselves. No one can come to me. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Speaking of those who are saved, those who come in fulfillment of God's eternal decree of election, right? Those who come those who come are all taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, this is speaking of the same thing that we're talking about in John chapter 17, verse 6, 7, and 8 now specifically, in the Lord teaching them the words which God the Father has given. Those who come to Christ, come to the Father, are those, verse 45, who have been taught by God. Literally, they are the hearing ones and the learning ones. And that's rendered in the English here as passive. They are hearing and the recipients of teaching, the recipients of that which was spoken, right? The recipients of that knowledge are coming to them. They are the hearing ones and the learning ones. In other words, again, this is not something that they are doing in their own power, their own strength. They are the hearing ones and the learning ones of that revelation which is coming to them from Jesus Christ of God the Father. Turn the page and look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and drop down to verse 42. John chapter 8, verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why is it that you do not understand my speech? Here's why. Because you are not able to listen to my word. You see, this is a supernatural revelation. Look at John chapter 9. John chapter 9, in verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. The only way to understand a text like this is in the context of what we're talking about. Supernatural revelation, right? God is taking those who do not see, and God in his grace and in his mercy is causing them to see, right? Right? 
Then some of the Pharisees were with him, heard these words, verse 40, and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, verse 41, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Look at John chapter 10 and look down at verse 25. John chapter 10, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you are of the world. You are not of my sheep. It hasn't been given that you should believe. You are not of those who have been given in eternity past by God the Father to God the Son. Do you see? No one can know the Father. No one can know the Father any farther than Jesus Christ wills to reveal him. Now, some are tempted by their flesh to despair in light of that truth, right? Some are tempted to look at truths like that fatalistically, right? And maybe they're, maybe they're convicted over their sin. Maybe you're sitting there right now. You know you're not saved. You know you're not right with God. You're still living in the world. You're still living in your sin. You know that. You're sitting there and you acknowledge that. Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't despair. Trust in Christ. Right? The Lord Jesus Christ came and he lived and he died to be a sacrifice for sinners. And if you repent, turn from your sin and trust him, all of these glorious blessings are yours in him. All of these glorious promises, all of these comforts, all of these encouragements, heaven, Christ is your inheritance, is your portion forever. If you will just turn from your sin, don't despair, turn to Christ. Despair over your sin, right? Your wicked sin, despair over that. I am filthy, I am destitute, I am bankrupt before God. I have nothing to offer him. Nothing in my hands can I bring. All I can do is to the cross I cling, right? Cling to the cross. Today, today, turn from your sin. Put your faith and trust. Entrust yourself to him. And today, follow Christ in faith. Today, don't despair over the sovereignty of God and salvation. No way, rejoice in the sovereignty of God in salvation. If it weren't for the sovereignty of God in salvation, not a one of us would be saved. Despair over your sin and flee to Christ who is your refuge. You have no hope apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll just turn to him and be saved. He presents to you the gospel today. You're here, hearing the word of God preach. You have a Bible in your hands. What grace, what mercy. And for many of you, you've been here a long time. And so you hear it repetitively, week in and week out, day in and day out. The grace and mercy of God. Be saved, all you ends of the earth. The result of this, right? The, the result of all this, this revelation, is genuine salvation. It's a supernatural work. The Lord Jesus Christ reveals God, to the Father, God the Father to them. He manifests his name to them and they are gloriously saved. It's a, a wondrous part of God's effectual call, efficacious call of the sinner to come. Once they've come, the result of this divine revelation, this divine calling is a fruitful faith. Look at point three on your notes. Point three on your notes. True disciples of Christ are distinguished from the world. True disciples of Christ are distinguished by revelation. And thirdly, true disciples of Christ are distinguished by a fruitful faith. Look at verse six. Jesus prays, I've manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Listen to that, they've kept your word. Verse seven, they've known that all things which you've given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you've given me and they have received them and they have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. Now listen to these five different verbs, right? Related to these that God has, or that the Lord Jesus Christ has manifested in the name of God the Father too. Verse six, they have kept your word. They've obeyed you, right? That's speaking of their 
holiness, their obedience. Number two, verse seven, they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Verse eight, they have received them. Verse eight, they have known surely that I came forth from you. And verse eight, they have believed that you sent me. Now these five verbs represent two essential truths, two essential truths, and here they are. Verse six, the Lord Jesus Christ manifests God to them, reveals God to them, and they keep his word. True disciples of Christ are obedient to God's word. They keep his word. Secondly, we see this in verse seven and eight, that based on what they know, based on what they know, based on what has been revealed to them, they both, gen genuine disciples, true Christians, both receive and believe. They receive and believe. All that to say, in looking at man's responsibility now, is that we're not robots. We're not robots, right? God doesn't just, zap, he doesn't hold us by marionette puppet strings and we're just, you know, do it. we're not robots. We have a will. We make choices. A will bent toward God and choices acceptable to God, think about it with me now, all find their source in the grace of God, right? A will that is bent toward the things of God, a choices that are acceptable to God, in other words, done in faith, all of those choices and that will, they find their source in the grace of God alone, right? In other words, if you don't have a will bent toward God, you're of this world, you're outside the grace of God. If you make choices that are uh, persistently, consistently, unrepentantly, for your own self-indulgence that are of the world, you're proving yourself to be of the world. A will bent toward God, choices acceptable to God, all find their source in God's grace alone. True disciples, genuine Christians, work out their salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who is at work in them, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So as we look at those two essential truths, right? We can say this. One, based on divine truth and empowered by divine help, these men, true disciples, keep his word. They keep his word. That word there, they kept your word means to obey. So what is the mark of a true disciple? What is the mark of the one given by the father to the son, the one to whom the son manifests the name of the father? They obey his word. They keep his word. This is their heart, their desire, their fight, their drive. They keep his word. Now, you might say here, looking at these disciples, that the Lord says of them in verse six, they have kept your word. It's a pretty audacious statement considering their many failures. Right? They, they failed a lot. The Lord is about to be arrested and what are the disciples gonna do? They flee. He's about to pray in the garden of Gethsemane. What are they doing? They're sleeping. It's, um, Peter is going to deny him three times, right? Praise God that he forgives our many failures. and characterizes them here in light of their failures. He characterizes them here as keeping his word. What grace, right? What mercy. You're not gonna come to Christ and be um, perfectly and fully sanctified, right? We learned that in Sunday school this morning. It's progressive. And it is a work of God in the believer to sanctify you. These disciples, they stayed with him in John chapter six, didn't they? When everybody else departed. They stayed with him, right? They were prepared to die with him in Jerusalem as he went to see Lazarus in chapter 11, if you remember that section of scripture. And as compared with the world, they have been separated to him and have been following him by faith. Now, you may not be perfect, and I know you're not, and you know you're not either. <laughs> you're not gonna be perfect. But have you been separated to Christ from this world? And are you following him in faith? Are you striving against sin? Are you, are you following him? J.C. Ryle said this, in themselves, believers have no life or strength or spiritual power. All that they have of vital religion comes from Christ. They are what they are and they feel what they feel, and they do what they do because they draw out of Jesus a continual supply of grace, help, and ability. 
So think about it. Sometimes you say, I don't feel like it. I don't feel. <laughs> Acknowledge that before God. Pray and ask that God would change your heart. <laughs> that you feel. You're, you're going to draw that supply from Christ. Listen to B.B. Warfield. B.B. Warfield. We may point out, therefore, that the doctrine of inability does not affirm that we cannot believe, but only that we cannot believe in our own strength. It affirms only that there is no natural strength within us by which we may attain to belief. But this is far from asserting that on making the effort, we shall find it impossible to believe. We may believe in God's strength, in God's strength. Our case is parallel to that of the man with the withered hand. He knew he could not stretch it forth. That was the very characteristic of a withered hand. It was impotent. But Christ commanded and he stretched it forth. You could say that he stretched it forth in faith, right? So God commands what he wills, and he gives while he commands. Unable in ourselves, we may taste and see that the Lord is gracious. These very struggles of the soul are an evidence of the working of the Holy Spirit within us, so that we are justified in saying to every distressed sinner, in the words of Principal Gore, act against sin in Christ's name as if you had strength, and you will find that you have it. All dis true disciples keep his word. Secondly, based on what they know, they both receive and believe. Verse eight sort of explains verse seven. They have known, verse seven, they have known that all things which you have given me are from you for or because they have received and believed, verse eight. The disciples didn't always fully understand them, but they had faith that what Jesus said was true and has come down from the Father. Fourth on your notes, true disciples of Christ are distinguished by a preserving grace, a preserving grace. The Lord says in verse nine, I pray for them, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. This is all based on who they are in Christ, what they've been given in Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ prays. In light of that, he prays for their keeping in verse 11. We are kept by the power of God, kept by divine, powerful, preserving grace. And that's what the Lord is interceding for here, that we would be kept not for the world, but for those whom have been given to Christ by the Father, those whom he's given out of the world. Literally there, the Lord says this, I ask not for the world I ask, but, strongest adversative there, for those you have given me. The ground of this prayer is because, verse 9 at the end there, they are yours, and I'm glorified in them. And we sometimes have a saying in my home, right? Um, my wife might say to me, what's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. <laughs> That's the way we might say it. It doesn't work that way here, right? There's this... Um, Dual ownership. This is a Trinitarian, a Godhead, Trinitarian verse. And the, the Lord Jesus Christ asserting this is an assertion of his own deity. D.A. Carson said this, however wide is the love of God, however salvific the stance of Jesus toward the world, there is a peculiar relationship of love, intimacy, disclosure, obedience, faith, dependence, joy, peace, eschatological blessing and fruitfulness that binds the disciples together and with the Godhead. He's not praying for the world. He's praying for disciples. Does that mean that we don't pray for the world? No. Yeah, we should pray for the world. Well, what do we pray for them? They would turn to Christ and be saved. Right? They would turn to Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, it would be according to his will that he should manifest God to them and the world might be saved through him. What a, what a glorious salvation that we've been delivered to. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that you would 
illumine us, Lord, enlighten us. Continue in your grace and mercy to us to manifest the Father to us for your glory, for the glory of God the Father, for our good, for your eternal praise and worship. There's someone here, Lord, that, that isn't saved. God, in your great mercy, in your abounding grace, Lord, please save them for the sake of your Son, for the sake of your glory, that they would worship you, that they would praise you. Lord, and may they be eternal testaments of the riches of your kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We love you. We thank you for this text. Thank you for these truths. Please, Lord, let us live in light of them. In Jesus' name we pray all things. Amen. Amen.